other conferences and the test match, <laughs> it's not easy to <laughs> assemble a meeting. I think Saturdays would be better, or evenings might be better. I think we'll have to change the remaining ones so that the, this problem doesn't arise. Well, this is the, what, sixth, isn't it? Sixth in the series of living rivers and dying rivers. We had the Yamuna, the Ganga, the Yamuna, Kosi Bagmati, rivers in the northeast, that's four. Five, second again, Bagmati, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was the Northeast, uh, Brahmaputra and others. And then again, the second one on Bhagmati by Deepak Gewali and Ajay Dikshit on the 15th of... Uh, they came for another meeting, so we took advantage of that, and that was an unscheduled thing. So this becomes number six. And we have three or four more going up to March 2012. Even then, we don't cover all the states, all the rivers. I think uh, Orissa is not covered. Um, West Bengal is covered in a way because we are talking about the Ganga, but you could have other things like Swarnareka and so on. They are not covered. And uh, Gujarat is covered, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, Madhya Pradesh, Punjab, and so on. But Punjab goes into the industry system. It's a separate series of Generally. issues. Uh, but we can, the idea is eventually to put all this together, compile them into a, an edited book, for which, of course, I had sent out a circular asking for papers, but no paper has come yet. And uh, I'll have to remind them again, because they shouldn't wait till the last one is over on, in March 2012. I would like to start doing that work from now on. I, that applies to you also. After this is over, as soon as possible, to send the, I'll send you the style sheet, yeah. and that for you also. I think we may even think of getting some extra papers written on rivers not covered in these meetings. I think that would be a good idea. We'll have to find suitable writers. Well, this thing came up because one kept asking oneself, what is happening to our rivers? Why is it that the river of the capital is a sewer? Why is it that the most holy river of India is nothing better than a sewer? Why is it that Gandhiji's river, Sabarmati, is dead? What is happening to these rivers? And uh, then we thought that, then it was uh, mentioned by someone that not all the rivers are dead. Some are in fairly good shape. Tamraparni in Tamil Nadu, for instance. But once again, is that a temporary condition? Is that also going to die? Or will it survive? And if it survives, what makes it survive? Is it a case like the Brahmaputra where nobody can touch it because it is out there in the wilderness? Uh, or is it uh, anything which is within easy reach is bound to be polluted, contaminated, dried up and reach the condition of the Yamuna and the Ganga? So this, I thought it's worthwhile finding out. That's why I thought of this series. And IIC picked up the idea quite enthusiastically. And uh, it's not easy to arrange this series of a dozen or more lectures with people from outside Delhi. Usually IIC meetings are for people who are here or people who happen to be here. Uh, we don't undertake a large number of uh, meetings with people being brought from outside and so on. This is one. And uh, the audience has been varying. There's, some of them have been well attended. Uh, today is not a very good day, but uh, I hope we can change that in the remaining ones. So we are really trying to understand what is happening to our rivers, why, and what can be done about it. For instance, we say we respect our rivers, we are divinities, but we obstruct their flow with dams and barrages, we divert them, we dump pollution and contamination into them. We occupy their floodplains, which are an integral part of the river. We mine sand from the riverbed. We do everything possible to kill the river. And then we start programs and projects for saving rivers and reviving rivers, and set up a National River Conservation Authority. There is the Ganga project, there is the Yamuna project. And uh, then on the Ganga, we have what, spent thousands of crores and more than 10 years, 12 years. And it's as bad as it ever was. 
so I think it's the fact is that we just don't understand what is happening and why. Or we understand very well what is happening and we are powerless to prevent it. I don't know which is the right explanation. You would be interested to know that I published a paper on an alternative <laughs> national water policy in the EPW some time back and there was a reply to it, a comment, a detailed critique on it by a, a young, an engineer. And one of the things I had said in that article was a river must flow. If it doesn't flow, it's not a river. He challenged it. He says, that's your opinion, that's not my opinion. I think a river must feed a reservoir. A river must provide water for irrigation, otherwise it's not a river. This is the alternative explanation or definition that he gave. If this is the kind of thinking that prevails, it's no wonder that rivers are dead. You know, there is a very well-known remark by an American water manager. I just quoted in Ken Konka's book, uh, Governance of Water, Governing Water. He, say, he quotes an eminent water manager as saying, I love pushing rivers around. This is, as it were, a sort of a declaration of faith, a creed, a love pushing rivers around. Most of our manager, engineers and managers can say this too, though they may not explicitly say it. That is what pe people believe. And that is why you have this kind of a problem. Anyway, I won't go on uh, in generalities. We have two speakers, Paranita Dandeka. Now, are you with Gomuk Trust or are you with Sandra? No, I was with Gomuk, but yes. I'm now with Sandra. You have moved, I see. But you're still in Pune? Yes, I'm based in Pune. And you have been walking around, observing rivers. Yes. But yes. I have also, you have also been writing on other subjects beyond rivers. No. Environment and... Environment, things. yes, but it's mainly to do with rivers. And we have Pandurang Hegde, who is... Both of them are researchers, come activists. Well, <laughs> I would say I'm not qualified to be a researcher, but activist. Activist come researcher. Oh, activist <laughs> come researcher. Okay. You change the order. Yes. Yes. Very good. So I will... Uh, Ask them to say, you, you go first and then after that, pondering uh, Hegde. You can take this, time is not a constraint. We have time till 1.30, so you can go to 30, 40 minutes. And uh, then uh, there will be plenty of time for discussion. Not too many people to discuss them. Okay. I think we'll have to move there. Well, firstly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, IRG and also India International Center. Uh, it was because of this series that uh, I personally got a chance to sort of put together a lot of things which were, you know, which were very, very distributed and to think in a sort of a more uh, lateral way about rivers in Maharashtra. We've been working, about, working with uh, single rivers per se, but this was a good chance to put it all together and look at it in a slightly broader perspective. Uh, uh, I'm not very qualified to analyze what's the situation of rivers in Maharashtra, so this is more or less of a collection of river stories from Maharashtra. What's happening with uh, a number of rivers in Maharashtra? Initially, the focus was on rivers in Western Ghats. Uh, uh, because is there a geographical separation between what you're going to cover and what uh, yes, I'll, I'll cover just uh, two rivers from Western Ghats in Maharashtra, and I think Pandurangji will be covering from the Karnataka. From the kar from Karnataka's. Um, so it's logically coming from? Yes, from, from Western Ghats. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, from north to south. And uh, I was also very happy to see the Living Rivers part in the Living Rivers, Dying Rivers mm -hmm. series, because I was under the impression that uh, rivers in Western Ghats are the last examples, uh, one of the last examples of living rivers in India because of uh, their fortunate um, geographical location, they don't form uh, large river valleys, so it's very difficult to make uh, dams on them. Most of the rivers in Western Ghats and Maharashtra, even today, are undammed. So, um, you know, it was a very good chance for me to, we were working on free-flowing rivers and how free-flowing rivers, the goods and services to the community of free-flowing rivers, are uh, uh, substantially higher than their dammed counterparts. It was also very easy to study that in a smaller watershed like the Western Ghats, where the average length of a river is maximum up to 120 kilometers in Maharashtra. In Karnataka, they are slightly bigger. So, uh, But then when we started to put together information on Western Ghats, uh, the reality which emerged was slightly different. We'll go into that later. 
So then we thought that we should also think about river revival and what's happening in Maharashtra about river revival. And so the scope was slightly broadened to include two more rivers in Maharashtra where river restoration works are going on. So, um, uh, to so this is Maharashtra. We have the Western Ghats, which forms the west, uh, western ridge line of Maharashtra. The average elevation is around 1,200 feet above the uh, sea level. There's a very steep escarpment on the western side, and it slopes gently towards the east, forming the Deccan Plateau. Uh, so the rivers, which uh, it's very interesting to see, uh, for example, um, uh, places like Mahabaleshwar, which is an origin of five rivers, out of which Shastri goes to the west, but uh, there's Krishna and Koina and Venna, which emerge nearly from the same point but f go towards the east. We all know their stories. We should also see what Savitri's uh, story is. It's a very small river and goes towards the west and meets the Arabian Sea. Uh, well, these are some statistics. Most of them are well known. Maharashtra is the third largest state in India. Uh, 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 the population as per the 2011 census was around 112 million people. It's also the most urbanized state in India. It's around 42.43 percent of the population is urban, but that uh, can be a sort of a misleading statistic because uh, this population is very concentrated in centers like Mumbai, Pune, Kolhapur, Nasik, but parts of uh, Maharashtra like Vidarbha or even Western Ghats in Vidarbha the rural population is around 85 percent, so its general statistics can be slightly misleading. Uh, percentage of gross irrigated area is uh, around 4,000 hectares and as compared to the uh, uh, the uh, percentage of irrigated area is around 4,000 hectares, and as compared to the uh, gross cropped area, this is just about 17 percent, which is um, lower than the national standard. We also have the uh, maximum dams in the country, around 35 percent of dams in India. Around 1,800 dams are located in, in, in Maharashtra, and we are, you know, uh, uh, just some, we are, from the second dam builder, we are leaps and bounds ahead, more than double of, Ma of Madhya Pradesh. Um, uh, for Gujarat, uh, I'll have to see. It's around uh, 600 dams in Gujarat. 600 dams in Gujarat. Yes, yes, yes. So. It is a real development, developed state. Developed state, yes. Uh, so these are the river basins of Maharashtra. But if I could have a pointer, or maybe uh, it's okay. okay. Uh, the yellow area is Godavari Basin. It is around 50% of the geographical area of Maharashtra. It's met by a number of rivers. In the upstream, there is Mula and Paravra. In the middle stream, there is Purna. Uh, it would be good to have a point. In the midstream, there is Purna. And when Godavari flows out to the boundary, it, it, it also gets water from the Vidarbha region, from the rivers in Vidarbha, that is Painaganga, Vainaganga, and Vardha. Uh, thank you. So uh, this will be Purna and Dudna, which join in the middle reach. Then there is the Painaganga, which comes from here. Th this is Vardha, and this part is the river Vainaganga. And Vainaganga meets Godavari right at the border of Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh. This is, uh, is it? Yeah? Yeah, it's sort of, you know, it looks as if it's constricted or something. So. Uh, this is the Krishna Basin. Krishna forms around 22% of the geographical area of Maharashtra. This is the Tapi, which forms around 17%. And this is the tiny, tiny bit of small part of Narmada, which just touches the boundary of Maharashtra. Now, this part, the entire region, is the rivers which go towards the west, the Western Ghat rivers. Uh, 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 it's, it's very interesting that, uh, I'll just show you the Though the geographical area, if you see, it's around 10% of the entire Maharashtra, the uh, percentage, the 75% uh, dip dependable yield of these rivers is around 44%. It's very high. And uh, the, water, the irrigation department has been lamenting that this water cannot be stopped and it's wasting because they can't build dams. They can't also uh, utilize the water and bring it up to the water deficit basins of Krishna and Godavari. Uh, but uh, it's not as if it's not utilized. Because of their very uh, strong geographical position of being there, uh, flowing just 60 kilometers down to the sea, we are using them in a much different way. And uh, we'll just see what will happen if we do dam them. So uh, we went here. So 